Happy Friday, Canada. Congratulations on making it to the end of the week. For your reward, you get Fake News Friday, the only show keeping Canada's failing, fake, and biased legacy media in check. I'm Harrison Faulkner, filling in for Andrew Lawton, who usually fills in for the great Candace Malkin, who's taking some much-deserved time off with her family. Now, sitting in the seat I usually occupy is the very talented Rupa Subramania, the host of the Rupa Subramania podcast. Now, before I throw it over to you, Rupa, I just got to say, besides being one of Canada's top journalists, you happen, you happen <laughs> to have a real knack at getting a, getting a rise out of the left on Twitter. Now, I don't know if it's intentional or it's by accident, but my goodness, you know how to get a rise out of them. What's your, what's your reaction been to the left's reaction of your reporting? What's it been, over two, two weeks now, two and a half weeks? Yeah, well, well, first of all, Harrison, thanks for having me here. It's a real honor to be here. Um, and, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm the top journalist in Canada. I, I, I don't even think I'm in the top 10. I'm just... I'm just a, you know, just a simple person sitting here in Ottawa and uh, writing on things that I care about. And that's pretty much it. And I'm not afraid to call it as I see it. Uh, and uh, but going back to your question, uh, uh, and this was a big story that I broke a couple of weeks ago on uh, these court documents that reveal that Canada's uh, travel mandate, um, uh, uh, vaccine mandate for travel, had no scientific rationale. It was all driven by politics, uh, with the prime minister using the um, the uh, the vaccine mandate as a political wedge issue, uh, in the hopes of getting a majority um, uh, for an election. He called two days after he announced uh, the mandate, um, and it, the, the story itself got a, a you know an extraordinary amount of traction online. A lot of people shared it. I got. Uh, many, many messages of support and encouragement and people uh, really glad that I uh, that I got to the bottom of this. Uh, but there were a few people, I would say, who were um, more than just a few people who were really riled up, uh, I, I would say, uh, at this uh, at this um, uh, at, at my story. They were, um, you know, making accusations uh, that this was well, first of all, they said these court documents didn't even exist. Um, that I was making it all up. <laughs> um, and then uh, and then uh, the federal court tweets um, saying that, hey, guys, uh, given the extraordinary amount of interest in this case, we're actually releasing these documents right now. So that shut them up right away. But then they had to move on to something else. Um, and, uh, and then they started calling me a Russian agent and, um, you know, the, the usual smear, uh, that, that, uh, that, you know, those of us in the independent space are accus accustomed to, uh, being at the, you know, we're at the receiving end of such smears. Um, and that, uh, you know, that I was just, uh, again, making it up. I'm a liar and so on and so forth. No, no one actually was engaging with the story. No one was actually trying to, um, you know, actually engage with what I was trying to say and what the court documents themselves reveal. I mean, you don't even have to believe me. Just look, take a look at the court documents. Um, and, uh, and, and, I, and I flagged two, uh, two specific responses uh, to my story. Uh, one of them was from liberal MP Mark Greetson, um, and uh, the other one uh, being Charles Angus of the NDP. Mark Greetson uh, said that, um, you know, he tweeted saying, and he was, by the way, he was quote tweeting a journalist um, who, 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 who didn't even react to what he was saying, which, which in itself is pretty revealing. Um, and Mark Greetson said that, uh, that, that my story was, uh, uh was, was, uh, blatant propaganda. It was uh, that I was lying and that, uh, and, and this kind of, we shouldn't wait till the next election to confront, uh, this kind of blatant lying and propaganda. It must be confronted now. Um, when I read that tweet, I was, you know, I was really taken aback. I was, uh, you know, it, it was it was chilling because this is coming from a politician from the governing party. He's no garden variety um, anonymous troll, um, and uh, and he he was, you know, he was taking such a strong uh, position against a story that he didn't um, he 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 didn't agree with, and he was taking it out on not just the story but also the journalist. And, um, and, and then, then there was a second reaction from Charlie Angus of the NDP, uh, and, uh, and he said that uh, this is written by a National Post columnist. The National Post gets tons of money from the government, so, uh, to, and so therefore, they're, you know, they're, they're, they get money from the government and they're spread, spreading BS and propaganda. 
Um, yeah, and, well, uh, insinuating insinuating that anybody who takes money from the government can't be writing critical articles about the government. That's kind of exactly. the angle, which is just exposing this whole thing to begin with. And yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if, if they had, if the liberals knew that their mandates could stand on their own and there was justification for them to stand on their own, I don't think they'd be reacting the way they did to your reporting, Rupa. But you mentioned this point about anonymous online trolls and how usually journalists will face uh, will face pushback and even hate from anonymous online trolls. That's the game we all end up having to, to play with. But it's different when it's politicians. It's different when it's actual journalists that are on the other side of... Uh, on the other side of the house. I mean, that's just sort of, that's just a, a, an unheard of thing. But I want to, I want to talk about this Canadian Association of Journalists tweet, because what we've been hearing, it's, it's really been, it, I think it's been so overused and we've been hearing it for what, four weeks now. It's, it's this whole new push from what we're seeing, I think, from a lot of legacy media journalists to make it seem as though they are victims that the rest of Canada are attacking these journalists, particularly these young female journalists, and sending them death threats and sending them horrible messages. Now, we're not going to condone any of that. Anyone who sends any messages like that are, are, are stupid, they're dumb. But the point that is, the point that I think should be raised about this is the Canadian Association of Journalists wrote on Twitter, they, they tagged Toronto Star, The Hill Times, Global News, and they all kind of joint signed this list of demands, which they sent to the police to, what is it? The Toronto police, Ottawa police, and the RCMP. And I just want to read it because it's just ridiculous. So <laughs> they start off by saying enough is enough. Online hate against journalists must be addressed. And then today, the Canadian Association of Journalists sent a list of demands to the police, including four federal ministers and the Ontario Attorney General. So I'm going to quickly summarize the, this list of demands because the last one, I think, is just such a, such a kicker. So the first one is, we need a comprehensive and cooperative approach to online hate across police forces. Recent threatening emails to journalists use similar language used by domestic extremist groups. Journalists who showed support for colleagues were also targeted. And the next one is, police forces must review and improve their processes for making complaints of hate speech and harassment. Victims should not be waiting hours on the phone to file complaints or be treated rudely and dismissed by officers. You see, Victims should not be threatened by police even. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just ridiculous. Number three, we ask for greater transparency and dialogue from police forces to help keep journalists and all targets of hate safe. And then, and then here at the bottom, I just want to list this off. They write, for the most part, the targets of these hateful and threatening messages are women and women of color in Canadian media. We will not tolerate any more. Enough is enough. Well, there happens to be a, a woman of color, a female journalist of color, who received not just hate from an anonymous online trolls, but hate from actual politicians in this country. Rupa, I want to ask you, did the Canadian Association of Journalists ever bother to ask you how you were handling all the hate you were receiving for <laughs> real journalism? Um, no, I, I what a say shocker. no. <laughs> uh, I, I, I didn't even rate a mention in in their uh, tweet or uh, no. I, I, you know, I think I think as far as uh, journalists in the independent space are concerned, we just don't even exist as far as the legacy media is concerned, right? It's all about them. Uh, look, um, of course, you know, if there are credible threats to one's personal safety, I've been at the receiving end of that, not not here in Canada, but overseas, you know, over the course of my career. Uh, and when it comes to credible threats like that, you go to the cops, you go to the police and you 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 and you allow the, uh, law and order to take its course. That's what most normal people do. You don't take these threats to Twitter and complain about it there. You, 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 you know, that, that just makes no sense to me. Or you could do both. Why don't you do both? Uh, the point is that, you know, unfortunately what, what en ends up happening, what's ended up happening is that the journalists, instead of reporting on the story, have become the story themselves. And I didn't go to journalism school. Um, I think you did, I did but, yeah. I, but, but I think this is this is one of the things that they teach you in journalism school. You should never become the story yourself. You should you should you should you should uh, report on the story. And that's a very important distinction. And I think a lot of um, uh, many journalists, um, um, you, you know, especially those who identify themselves as being on the left um, uh, ideologically tend to forget this lesson and they make it about themselves for whatever reason. I don't know. Maybe it's, it's to get, gain more traction on social media. It's to get more attention. 
um, I, 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 don't under, I, I really don't understand. If you were to ask a journalist covering a warlike situation in, you know, whether it's Afghanistan or, um, or you know, in a conflict zone, for example, um, do you see them taking to Twitter and, uh, and, and you know, and, 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 you know, and saying that, you know, this has been happening to them? I, I, I don't think so. I think, I think part of the same, journalists are not meant to be liked, people. I mean, this is, you've exactly. got to understand that. Um, you know, I like to be liked, but I also understand that that's not going to happen with everybody that I that I interact with. Uh, not all of my uh, readers uh, like me all the time, and that's fine. Um, I also get a lot of hate mail. I also get a lot of people saying, uh, "Why don't you go back to where you came from?" Um, you know, I could I could I could spend my time on Twitter and uh, and say and 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 say that this is you know I'm deeply offended. I'm racialized, so I'm a victim of uh, of uh, this sort of behavior, and I could spend a lot of time dwelling on this but you know i rather move on because i think there there are bigger bigger things to uh, to care about uh, you know and I, I i certainly don't want to be the story um so you know again uh, you know not to belittle the experiences of people who um um get uh, death threats their way or uh, threats of rape uh, i'm sure that's happening uh, these are genuine threats. These are credible threats. Take them to the cops. Let them decide, you know, let them investigate and get to the bottom of it. Um, yeah, I just don't see the purpose in, you know, in, in, in just taking to Twitter and then, uh, you know, and, and coming up with a conspiracy theory that this is all coming from the right. And, right, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah. But that's so, the easy, that's, that's sort of the easy way out and an easy way for them to continue to villainize a particular group of Canadians that I think, for the most part, have a lot of, have a lot of valid reasons to be upset at Canada's legacy media. Now, I want to, I want to go back to a point you made. You, you know, when was the last time you saw a real wartime journalist, a journalist who actually reports in the field in combat zone, go on Twitter and say, you know, these, these enemy combatants are firing bullets at me. Can, can someone please step in and stop? I mean, it's so rude. They're treating journalists so poorly. I mean, it's just ridiculous, right? I mean, I, 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 <laughs> I can't imagine any one of these crying journalists reporting in an actual war zone. If they can't even handle Twitter bots and Twitter anonymous trolls m writing messages about them, then they can't do any real reporting. And you make the point, Rupa, about journalists not wanting to be the story and they don't teach that in journalism school. Well, I think they didn't used to teach that in journalism school. That's why we have such a divide. We have a group of journalists who are cut from the old cloth, the real journalists in this country that know what it's like to uphold journalistic principles. They know what it's like to really do the job of holding power to account. Then you have this new, this new kind of fresh blood, this new class of journalists that are occupying these legacy media newsrooms who have been told by their journalism schools, because I've been in these inside of these classrooms, that as a matter of fact, it is okay for journalists to be activists. In fact, I remember in my second year, in my second year at school, we were given an assignment to write a, write a story about if journalists could be activists, if journalists could make themselves part of the story. And the professors were pushing that line to us. So they, they, they've told a whole new class of journalists that you need to find a way to make yourself part of the story. You need to get yourself into it, be an activist, get in there for political causes. And you know, that's why I, I consider, I don't consider myself to be a journalist. I consider myself to be in the media space. There's a big distinction. I know what I do is not right down the line, but I don't pretend that I'm, I'm one of those people. And that's, I think the big difference. And I think Canadians just want some honesty from these reporters. And again, it just shows you the Canadian Association of Journalists, they, 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 are totally lacking in actually standing up for journalists in the field who receive real credible hate. Of course, they weren't there to help you out, Rupa. But no, take, take... They, they weren't. And and let me just uh, yeah. tell you tell you something real quick here. Uh, you know, I, I come from a family of academics and uh, and you know people who uh, you know have a view on everything. And you should see the kind of hate mail that they get. Uh, and they're not, they're not, uh, you know, th they take it in their stride, uh, you know, and again, as I say, it's not, our, our job here is not to be liked by people. I think that's a very, uh, that's the wrong approach. I think your, your, your job is to report the facts as they are and let people come to their, uh, you know, decide for themselves whether, whether they believe you or not. And if you get um, hate mail, that's par for the course that I get hate mail all the time. I get all kinds of, you know, people are, 
you know, I get uh, people, you know, from the progressive left. I've, I've, I've been at the receiving end of racist attacks from the progressive left. I've pointed several of these out, out on Twitter just, just out of interest. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, but I'm not, I'm not dwelling on this. And, you know, I certainly don't want to be a victim. Um, and I take these things in my stride. And if I genuinely feel threatened, but here's the thing. There's a difference between, um, you know, getting a threat from an anonymous troll and getting an implied threat from a member of the governing party. Oh, yeah. Um, right? Um, and the, the the latter is pretty insidious. It is sinister. I experience this kind of thing overseas. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I worry about it. You know, I, I'm telling you, I, I, I you know, it, it had a chilling effect on me. And an anonymous troll tells me something. I just block them and I move on. Yeah. Uh, but a politician, a sitting po- a, a politician, a, uh, an MP from the governing party says that this must be confronted now. Now, you can make the distinction that he was he was referring to my story and not me. But how do you separate the two? No, exactly. And I think just before we move on to the next story, there's so many important points. I mean, we could talk about this for an hour pretty much, but there's so many interesting little points to talk about with this new push from the Canadian Association of Journalists, this 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 approach to try and engage the police in the defense of a particular class of journalists, right? They're going to leave independent journalists behind, but they want the Toronto police, the RCMP, and Ottawa police to come to the rescue of a particular class of journalists. Now, a lot of people have pointed out that this is sort of a way to also justify liberal online censorship. And maybe you could go down there. I think there's definitely a conversation to be had about that. But the CAJ has just routinely failed to actually defend journalists. And this, the Toronto Star is a part of this, is a part of this sort of joint letter, right? This is the same Toronto Star that wrote a front page news story by pulling tweets that have apparently now been called into question. These so-called tweets that, that basically say the unvaccinated can go, can go to die. We don't care if there aren't enough ICU beds for the unvaccinated. They, they, they poured gasoline on a very, very divisive issue back when the vaccine issue was right at the heart of what we were discussing in this country. And now, after telling the unv- basically publishing on the front page that unvaccinated Canadians can die, the same Toronto Star is now saying that their journalists need the help of the police to come and defend them. And it's important to note, too, where was the CAJ, Rupa, when Andrew Lawton was pepper sprayed by police in Ottawa? Or when Alexa Lavoie Rebel was shot in the leg by a, a tear gas canister point blank by the police. Or, for example, when our own Candace Malcolm was basically being threatened by Kalistani extremists and had basically her house uh, targeted and her real safety targeted by Kalistani extremists who didn't like her reporting. Uh, you didn't see a bunch of police rush to the rush to the defense of uh, out, outwardly to the defense of Candace. You didn't see the Canadian Association of Journalists stop what they are doing and say we need to protect this journalist's right to do her job. You didn't see them there because I think the truth is they're really in it to protect one class of journalists, and that I don't think is us, Rupa. I don't think they're here for the independent journalists. No, th- they're not. Uh, they're for us, and neither should we count on them to be there for us. I think I think uh, that that would be a complete waste of time, and I. I think you know um you know as, as independent media gets stronger and I, it is for sure uh and uh you know gains more traction with the general public uh they're gonna have to uh you know at some point acknowledge our existence and it'll happen so- sooner rather than later no i think it will and i think as as more canadians realize what they're getting from the legacy media the more they cut the cable cord and 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 cut their subscriptions to the globe and national post and all these different places They're going to come to the legacy media and they're going to realize, you know, actually, this is where real journalism is being done. Now, switching gears, because as you know, those who those who watch this program know that we try to end the show on a bit of a lighter note. or We try and find something to laugh about on this show. Well, there's a Toronto Star op ed written by Michael Corrin, who's a former Toronto. uh, What's what was it? Sun News Network, the failed Sun News television network. He was he used to work there. The guy used to be a conservative, but he's totally switched his position and he's now bashing conservatives as much as he can in the media. Well, Michael Corrin wrote a wrote an article in the Toronto Star and the headline is the headline is Canadian Christian nationalism, not Christian. It's not Canadian or patriotic patriotic either. So you read that headline, you probably think, yeah, you know, probably not a ton of support for Christian national, nationalism in this country. But then how, how did I know, Rupa, that in this article <laughs> somewhere they were going to tie Pierre Polyev into <laughs> Canadian Christian nationalism? Sure enough, three paragraphs in, there he is. It seems to be the playbook for the legacy media. Uh, 
oh my goodness yes it's it it read like a screed a, <laughs> a rant and it had all the elements of verbal diarrhea from the left uh, you know yeah you you get uh, you have trump um you know you you have all of the the key keywords key buzzwords right you have trump you have the far right you have uh, nationalism you have pierre <laughs> pierre polievre you have the freedom convoy of course we can't forget th- those people so you know it just it just read like you know this this guy clearly it read like he had a lot of issues and he was just kind of uh, you know uh, you know going into this rant to get get this office chest uh but you know uh, i actually had to read this nonsense uh <laughs> because, and i blame you for this harrison but, uh, <laughs> sorry <laughs> uh, the things i have to do uh you know for true north but uh but anyway so you know he he's he's making a you know he has a very specific interpretation of christianity um he doesn't like calvinism that's pretty obvious and he has this very you know he's this elite disdain uh, you know that you know he says these people uh, at the protest they had misspelled uh, quotes from the bible or even misquoted from the bible so my question to him is does that mean that their faith is not genuine uh, they're not christians uh, if if they if they can't s- spell right um, you know it all sounded very very elitist um and and more to the point about you know his, his criticism of of christian nationalism see you can you can be a christian and you can be a nationalist so you can be a christian nationalist you can you can be a christian and you can be a socialist uh as a matter of fact the foundation of the british labor party is christian socialism and the foundation of many political parties uh in europe um so if you can be a christian and a socialist why can't you be a christian and a nationalist Uh, you know so basically this guy i mean in, in this uh, you know long rant you know he, it it comes across as though uh, and it's it's unfortunate that this is coming from a an anglican priest uh, or you know it doesn't matter that he's anglican but the fact that this is well, you from know a priest for, in general i think yeah yeah i mean he he just seems angry i thought priest right. was supposed to be kind and compassionate and <laughs> understanding of the other but it was it was quite the opposite uh he just he, he just sounded very hateful in his op-ed uh and to me to my mind it sounded like he wanted a situation where uh basically a small power elite decides uh what level of rel- religiosity we should have in society uh what brand of christianity uh we should have maybe even what brand of culture um it it just it just for me you know it was just um you know just plain nonsense yeah well i mean yeah. there's there's a the way that the legacy media do this they find the scariest words and put them together to try and gin up a lot of a lot of readership because as we know these guys are struggling to get viewers on their websites anyway so the more that they can use this sort of language and ride the american wave i mean if you're plugged into american news you'll know for example that a lot of people on the american right were having a total laugh at the atlantic this week when the atlantic tried to say that rosaries are now becoming a hate symbol an extreme hate symbol So of course, and there's also been some talk about Christian nationalism. There's a congresswoman who proclaimed that she was a, a proud Christian nationalist, and of course that just got the left up in arms. So but there's this very strange phenomenon happening where legacy media journalists are are so are so focused on trying to tie the the front runner in the conservative leadership race to the very worst elements of the of 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 politics. in our culture and you don't see that from the independent media on the other side so you won't see that but it's a very bizarre it's a very bizarre thing where they're trying to make Pierre Polyev out to be this extremely dangerous uh very fringe politician and it's bizarre to me because they almost treat Pierre Polyev worse than they do Maxime Bernier and anyone who knows the inside of conservative politics knows that Pierre Polyev is not a nationalist he definitely doesn't appeal to the christian nationalist or far right voting bloc and and his campaign is staffed with insider establishment conservatives so it's like this they're trying to kind of bend reality and i i think this is all desperation and panic really to me it yeah. really reeks of panic from them i absolutely it it's not at all bizarre i mean i that's what i wanted to say yeah. it, it's actually all quite predictable actually a uh, pierre polyever would be very much a centrist in american politics you know and that's 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 the irony of this whole thing 
they're panicking and uh, because you know you you have these polls coming out that show that younger people are turning conservative uh and uh possibly uh turning to peer so i think i think this is the kind of thing that really upsets them this is the kind of thing that could um uh, you know upset um you know existing narratives you know that they've so uh, tried so hard to uh, uh you know have in place over the last few years and uh, it's just it's just the elites, you know, it's just elite opinion facing a direct challenge right now. And uh, and, and they're trying to counter it by, uh, tr- you know, trying to smear the conservative leadership race and particularly Pierre Polyever, whether you like him or not, that's a different issue. But, you know, I think to tie him in with everything, including Christian nationalism, it's just really, really bizarre. It just is a sign of desperation, as you say. Yeah. And I think they're starting to feel it, too, that they know as they, they're going to try and demonize. Uh, yeah. This new group of, of, of fresh faced conservatives that are seeing mm-hmm. a new option. And that's, I think, their hope. Well, that's yeah. going to do it for us on the show today. Thank you for spending your Friday afternoon with us. Have a great weekend. This was Fake News Friday. That was Rupa Supermania. My name is Harrison Faulkner. Take care, everyone.